Hello, hello and welcome to What's Doing. I'm your host Abed and today we have a very special episode for you. The evolution of the music industry has been a journey marked by groundbreaking innovations and transformative shifts. From the era of vinyl records and cassette tapes to the digital age dominated by streaming platforms, technology has been a driving force behind the evolution. The advent of the internet revolutionized how music is produced, distributed and consumed, democratizing access for both artists and listeners. The rise of platforms like Napster, iTunes and Spotify ushered in new business models and challenged traditional revenue streams, leading to a period of adaptation and reinvention for record labels and artists alike. Additionally, social media platforms have enabled artists to directly engage with their fan base, forging deeper connections and expanding their reach. As the music industry continues to evolve, fueled by advancements in technology and changing consumer preferences, the landscape remains dynamic, promising further innovation and opportunities for growth. Looking at those incredible possibilities, Dinesh Ratnam, the newly appointed managing director of Warner Music Malaysia, took the big leap of faith from heading an OTT platform to the world of music. Dinesh is not new to the Malaysian entertainment industry. He has led iFlakes and iChi in the past. In his new role at Warner Music Malaysia, Dinesh is on a mission to disrupt the music business in Malaysia. Welcome Dinesh to What's Doing and thank you so much for taking time out. It's been a long time coming for you to come on to the show. Thanks Abir for having me. Ex excited to be here. I've been following all of the interviews you've had so far. Super interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm one of your podcast's uh, biggest fans. So, oh, wow. uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for first having me. Fa first fan on the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first things first. You made the one of the biggest jump from an ODD platform, Achi, to the biggest music company in Malaysia, Warner Music. What was the thought process which took you from an ODD platform to a music company? So I think, you know, firstly, uh, I, I was at Aichi for nearly three and a half years, uh, you know, started, you know, really building that brand from nearly scratch over in Malaysia uh, during COVID. So, you know, it was a great journey, a great ride, uh, you know, achieved a lot of milestones. Uh, and I think most importantly, really built and a, what I think is an amazing team uh, that's, you know, carrying on that execution of the strategy we had put in place even me, after I left. Uh, but, you know, as I, uh, I tend to think of my, my career in general in, in, you know, there's obviously a long-term view of what I want to be, but, you know, I also think in terms of every three years and I, what kind of impact can I create, uh, you know, in the ecosystem that I'm, I'm in. And I really felt at that point, you know, IG had achieved a lot. There was a strong foundation I built together with the team. And the team was in a great place to sort of carry that journey on. Uh, and sure, if I was there, you know, obviously I'll be able to continue to support them. But I felt, you know, they're really strong enough to be able to execute that uh, vision on their own. And I started to think about, you know, what other uh, sort of initiatives or impact I could create in the Malaysian ecosystem and as part of that thought process, you know, I'd done a whole bunch of different things in my life, you know, started my career in, in don't judge me, but I used to be a banker back in the day uh, and then kind of made my way over to the entertainment industry. So I think uh, having been in this for a few years now, like definitely felt that this is where I, where I wanted to be in, wanted to stay in entertainment, uh, you know, really wanted to be in the industry of enabling and commercializing creativity. And, you know, one big part of entertainment is really music. I feel like music is really the heartbeat of modern media. Uh, you know, it's it's consumed in different formats. You know, there's there's an audio element to it, obviously. But, you know, it's also highly visual. Uh, you know, there's written formats as well. And I feel it's really multi-format mm -hmm. uh, and crosses multi-platform. But in essence, it's really about telling uh, amazing stories at the end of the day. So I felt that, you know, uh, as my journey with as I take my journey in entertainment further, I felt like music was the natural next place uh, for me to extend that journey into because I just feel it's so central uh, to everything media. And I also do believe there's a lot of upside for the industry as well. I mean, which has obviously gone through a lot of transformation yep. in the last 20, 30 years. Mm. Uh, but I do feel as we look at the, the, the coming decade and the decades to come, I feel there's only further upside potential for music. So music business right now is going through a tremendous change. They're rewriting rules of music. And uh, I mean, every day there's a new thing coming up. 
and the whole business is changing by the by the day how are you managing to make this business relevant in these unpredictable times it has gone through a lot of change i've only i've only been in it for the last 6 months but you know just studying about the industry it has gone through a ton of change but i think in essence like what's really important is is just keeping artists and fans at the center of everything we do uh you know one of music really believe uh in the power of originality being able to move the world uh and we really focus on you know being a collective of individuals uh that believe in the power of expression uh so ultimately what i'm trying to get at is you know in order to stay relevant you have to sort of you know to stay relevant in a sea of change you have to go back to what your core focus is and and that will be able to anchor you through any storm right so which is essentially artists and fans so i think as long as we constantly think about what value we are bringing to the artists on a daily basis uh to allow them to express themselves uh freely to commercialize their cre- their creativity for them to reach every single fan they have out there i think we're doing a great job and on the on the other end of the spectrum as long as we are sort of delivering that artist experience to fans and we're constantly thinking about how can we bridge the gap between artists and fans and get them closer together and delivering you know even more unique experiences to fans from their favorite artists uh, again i think you know we do we we're, we're doing a job so ultimately uh yes the industry is going through a lot of change and i'm just probably going through a phase of change in itself and things are moving so fast now uh that who knows um if we have this conversation in a year's time you know things might be different and the world would have evolved as well but i do feel as long as we keep those two things at our core artists and fans we'll always stay relevant in the industry so tell me one thing miss malaysia has been blessed with great music music artists and also musicians and singers and uh, in the local talent you you'll find a lot of great local talents so how do you discover these gems and you know and how do you bring it under bring them all under the warner umbrella yeah malaysia has, has a lot of amazing talent you're absolutely right uh so so firstly you know we have a great anr team that's done a great job in discovering these these talents so the anr team's job is to really discover these talents bring them on board uh you know under under partnership with Warner Music and really developing and nurturing their careers so i think again like as we talked about the change uh the music industry has gone through over the decades i think historically uh i think you know the ANR ANR's job might have been a little bit harder because you really needed to be out there yeah. i think you need, you needed to physically be at different gigs you needed to physically be at events uh you need to physically be out there meeting a lot of people to be able to discover this ta- this talent before you're even able to sort of assess uh you know their real potential to being signed i think right now a lot of that you know with the digital age and you know a lot of potential artists a lot of great artists you know have been discovered through social media so you know we do have a lot of tools that allow us to gather data uh that are sort of collated from different social media platforms uh different streaming platforms to allow us to sort of like uh have a first filter of hey like uh who are the artists who sort of sort of making waves or getting traction on social media uh for the singing capability for example right so so i think you know firstly like discovery has is a little bit easier today than it was before by simply uh having the, all of these tools having said that like you know these tools just provide a first cut of how to actually start sourcing uh for some of these artists but end of the day like you still do you need to build a relationship with these artists you need to see you know ideally you want to see them perform live as well you want to see what the stage presence is you want to see their charisma you want to see what their personality is like you know if you if you get to see them perform in front of a crowd you want to see what how they connect with the crowd how the fans engage with the music uh so all these things are super important as well so although yes you can sort of like gauge someone's you could try to gauge someone's potential just from views of that person's video alone or streams of that person's uploaded cover song alone uh, on the other hand you really need a combine to assess a combination of these different things to really be able to figure out like who we want to work with uh the third piece is is really at the end of the day you know it is still a relationship driven business we do want to build that uh relationship and trust with the artists as well to really try to understand their needs and you know every artist uh has 
has their own dream, their own vision of where they want to be. Uh, every artist is in a different stage of their career. You know, some might be more established, some might be, uh, you know, developing, some might be totally new. They're just trying to trying to make a name for themselves. So, you know, each one of these artists have different needs, right? So I think it's really our job, you know, once we've kind of, we found them, uh, we, we've seen them perform live, we sort of established contact with them like it's really to sort of like understand how we can help them uh you know whether we we we, we can give them what they want and what they need at the right time uh because end of the day this this relationship is built on trust so so uh those things are all really important so tell me one thing means as a layman person how is the music business being done in 2024 and it means how companies like yours like Warner uh, and the talents under Warner's uh, you know uh, umbrella how are they making money and also because we all know that there are no vinyl there's no CD there are no cassettes anymore in the market to be, to be bought there's only Spotify and Apple Music so take us through how it's, it's still a lucrative business uh, talents are still making money companies like Warner is still making money how does it work I means what is the whole machinery like so yes, uh, although having said that, you know, you talked about nobody buying vinyls, cassettes and CDs anymore. You know, there, there is a bit of a vinyl trend coming back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people want these collectibles. But yes, the almost all of, of music, musical revenue uh, uh, made in Malaysia today is completely digital. So obviously back in the day you had, you know, you used to sell vinyl, CDs, cassettes, like you said. Uh, whereas today, most of that music revenue is coming from streaming platforms, as you mentioned, Spotify, YouTube. Apple Music and you know there are a bunch of other smaller platforms as well that also provide uh, music streaming on that platform. So the economics of the business has changed somewhat. Uh, so you know historically, um, you know when you sell CDs, like say you sell a hundred thousand CDs, uh, and I can't remember what a CD cost back in the day. Okay, sell like thirty ringgit, just say mm-hmm. right. If you sell a hundred thousand uh, CDs at thirty ringgit, you know that's like what three million, right? Uh, which is a good amount of money, right, for for selling 100,000 CDs or cassettes, right? Uh, whereas today, just to give you some context, uh, this number varies a little bit, but, you know, a million streams on Spotify is 4,000 ringgit. That's it? That's it. Yeah, that <laughs> is it. Uh, so you can see it's it's crazy. I mean, if you sold a million records back in the day at 30 ringgit each, that's like 30 million ringgit. You, if, you, if your song gets streamed a million times on Spotify, you're getting 4,000 ringgit, right? Uh, YouTube's around the same range as well, uh, maybe even slightly lower. And of course, these numbers vary, you know, depending on Spotify penetration, you know, how much the subscription price is, but, you know, it doesn't run too much from that range, right? So what this means, interestingly enough, is that, you know, upfront from uh, streaming on these platforms, you're getting a lot less money, as you imagine. Like with CDs, once you sell a CD, uh, you're getting all of the money upfront, right? Mm. Uh, with streaming, you're getting a lot less money up front. But what the difference is with CDs or cassettes or vinyls, uh, you get paid once and that's it, right? Yeah. Like if somebody buys your album, yeah. uh, you know, it's one and done, right? Whereas with streaming, if somebody wants to continue listening listening to your song for the next 10 years on Spotify, for example, you'd still get paid for that song being listened to in 10 years. So with streaming, the way I look at it, it's actually a lot less money up front, but the lifetime uh, value of recurring revenue you can get in the future becomes a lot more valuable, which is why, which is where you know it, the you know if you have a strong, ca- sizable catalog of songs, uh, and you've hit a certain amount of, and you've really connected with a certain amount of fans, you know, and these fans continue to listen to your songs for for years or decades to come, you'll be able to continue to make money from streaming platforms. So the economics are very different. In the old days, I think you get a lot of it upfront. Uh, whereas in streaming, you got to think longer term, right? You're not going to be able to make all your money up front from streaming alone. Mm. You can in in some cases, but most of it is value and revenue you see over the years. What that means as an artist or as a record label is that we recognize the value of that long tail of mm. streaming revenue. Uh, and we know that, you know, with the right artists, with the right songs, with the right catalog, you know, uh, us and the artists would be able to monetize that over the long term. But it does mean in the short term, there is a bit of a revenue gap versus the amount you need to invest uh, to, to promote the artist, promote the song, which means that we also need to look for other forms of revenue as well. So this revenue will come in the form of doing brand deals. Uh, so you see artists working with brands, 
you know, sync deals, getting getting songs f- from the artists uh, being used in, you know, OSTs or being used in uh, brand campaigns, brand jingles, you know, obviously doing shows, uh, live shows, concerts as well. So, you know, I think music today is about finding as many revenue streams as possible for an artist and their songs, uh, whilst knowing that, you know, the value of streaming revenue uh, would present itself over the long term. You, uh, glad you mentioned the concert part of it. So in the last six, eight months, Malaysia saw some one of the biggest acts ever done in Malaysia. Coldplay came, you know, Ed Sheeran came, and it was huge. It means they've never seen so much of uh, audience coming. They all came in hordes. I was also there with my back pain. Yeah, bump, bump, <laughs> bump into you at the, was it the Coldplay concert, right? Yeah, Ed Sheeran concert. Ed Sheeran yeah. concert, yeah. So you see that there is a lot of demand of uh, live concert and there's a lot of been written about concerts in Malaysia and some some of the artists skipping and going to other countries rather than performing in Malaysia. But you know there's a huge fan following for these kind of talents and there's a big demand. People are throwing in money to go for a, for a good concert for a big big name like a Coldplay or any other of, of that stature. So what are your plans looking at this performance in the last six months? What are the plans for you for the artists, whether it's local or international one artists coming down to Malaysia and performing. And what do you think will be the future of concerts in Malaysia going forward? You know, I'll, I'll talk about the international artists first. Uh, so I think in general, we would love to have more international acts perform in Malaysia. Uh, I think, you know, these performances, these concerts are just highly valuable for every stakeholder in the ecosystem. Uh, You know, from, uh, uh, you know, when an international artist comes down, you know, one, you look at the different stakeholders, if you're a fan, you know, obviously there's nothing more fulfilling as a fan to see your favorite artist perform live. Uh, And obviously, if you you stand a chance to meet with them, obviously that's that's the dream, right? Uh, So, you know, fans obviously super happy, right? Uh, And, you know, you only need to go to to some of these concerts that you mentioned to see how crazy the fans were, right? Uh, To be able to see the artist perform live, right? So fans are happy. And then, and then from the from the artist side, from the you know from the international artist side, you know most of them are. I mean, a lot a lot of what drives an artist ultimately are fans as well, yeah. right? Uh, so you know, being able to travel to Malaysia to meet their fans in Malaysia uh, is also highly fulfilling for the artists as well. So you know, they they would also benefit greatly from you know being able to perform more in Malaysia. Then if you look at, you know, the live entertainment ecosystem in Malaysia, you know, there are a lot of promoters, a lot of people in the music ecosystem, they will also benefit uh, from having concerts, more concerts in Malaysia. So again, uh, another plus point for another stakeholder in, in, the, in the ecosystem. Um, and then from, from our side and the local artist side as well, like uh, actually there's, there's a lot of benefit for local artists uh, when foreign acts actually come to Malaysia. So, for example, you know, one is uh, the many, many times, you know, we try to like as a record label, as a global record label, you know, if, if one of a, if a Warner act, Warner International act comes over to Malaysia, we try to facilitate uh, where possible, like meet and greets with the local artists, uh, you know, the local Malaysian artists with the foreign, with the foreign act mm-hmm. as well. And, you know, that obviously allows our local artists to learn, to meet, to learn, to bounce ideas off the foreign acts. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's subject to time scheduling and all of that. But, you know, just being able to meet uh, other acts from other countries that are highly established uh, is not only provides a source of inspiration, but a source of knowledge for our local acts as well. The other benefit is, you know, for Coldplay, we had our our act, our local act, Bunga, uh, uh, open for them, right? Right. it's not often a local act uh, can perform in front of an 80,000 strong stadium, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and she benefited massively uh, from that performance. I think, uh, you know, like the amount of training you have to go through to get the confidence to go up on stage and perform in front of that crowd. I think she did a fantastic job. Mm-hmm. And and right now, I'm pretty sure that, you know, other concerts of a smaller scale would, would feel a little bit less daunting once you've done like 80,000 people, yeah. right? Um, so you get that benefit as well. So obviously, with the, the more foreign acts come on board, we should try to facilitate local opening acts that give that opportunity for local acts to perform alongside or, you know, on the same stage as the foreign acts. And, you know, the third benefit 
actually from a from a music discovery and monetization perspective is you know Bunga's streams right so her streams across all of these digital platforms actually went up 70% wow. uh, after the Coldplay concert because all of a sudden you're performing in front of 8000 people not all of them might have been your fans before heard of your music before but then you know being on stage uh, in front of that kind of crowd helps with the discoverability of music so mm -hmm. you see that impact translate to streams as well so if you look at all of those benefits uh, generally, like, um, you know, we are definitely supportive uh, and we work together closely with all the promoters, local booking agents and all of that to sort of like try to facilitate more uh, of these foreign acts performing in Malaysia for sure, just because there's just so much value for the whole ecosystem. No, definitely, definitely. I think with the kind of exposure Bunga got for opening for, for Coldplay was just immense. And I think uh, uh, kudos to you guys who gave her that opportunity to perform before Coldplay. That's a tough deal actually for any artist to, to open up for a, for yeah, a big brand. Yeah, actually, you know, Coldplay, uh, Coldplay picked her actually. Oh, really? You know, we were kind of talking to Coldplay about, uh, about you know, a few different possibilities. I mean, this was done by the team before I joined, to be honest. Mm. Uh, so kudos to, to, uh, to the rest of the Warner team for sort mm. of facilitating that opportunity. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was Coldplay's decision. It wasn't a Warner Music Malaysia saying, hey, like, you have to have Bunga playing there. It was kind of like a two-way discussion uh, about who the right person might be. And Coldplay ultimately, you know, they made the decision uh, themselves as well. You know, they wanted to work with the Malaysian act and they felt Bunga would be the right one. Oh, that's great. So now tell me one thing. that Now music is freely available when you go to Instagram or TikTok. You know, everyone is posting videos and, and, and you know, pictures with, with new songs coming in. What is the revenue model out there? How is a company like Warner Music is making money out of, out of those songs which is being used on social media, on these reels and stories? Firstly, I want to say before I talk about the revenue model. So firstly, actually social media is uh, a super important uh, source of discovery for songs. So, you know, historically, uh, Back in the day, I think like, you know, for example, radio had huge importance mm. uh, for the discovery of songs. Uh, today, radio is still important, but that discovery is more fragmented than it used to be across different social media platforms, right? So, you know, there's still radio, there's social media platforms, there's other. So discovery of songs is much more fragmented with social media taking up a larger and larger chunk of that discovery. So, so we actually see social media first and foremost as, as critical and essential for the discovery of songs. Uh, uh, we've seen, you know, you know, just within the last six months of me being at, at Warner, we've seen like um, crazy uh, social media stories, which have has helped some of our songs really travel to Indonesia or across the region. Uh, so for example, we had a song uh, called Sah by Sarah Suhairi and Alfie Zumi. Uh, so this song hit the number one charts in Malaysia this year. So this is a song we, uh, we did in partnership with uh, a local label, MVM. Mm. Uh, so this song not only hit the charts in Malaysia, but it went viral on TikTok in Indonesia. Uh, so TikTok videos, the number of TikTok videos created using this song, uh, I think hit like 1.5 million. Wow. And those 1.5 million videos using the song amassed about 1.8 billion views. Uh, and the song was released, at the, I think, at the end of January. So these just are crazy numbers, you know. These, these are, are crazy numbers. These are crazy numbers, right? And 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 translating from that, right? You then start to see that trickle in to Spotify Indonesia. So the song actually hit. I think it's the highest ranking Malaysian song on the Indonesian Spotify charts this year, and it hit number thirty five on the Indonesian charts, right? Uh, which is pretty impressive for a Malaysian song in Indonesia. We hope to see more and more of that. Uh, but you know, I think a big uh, a big source of that success was really the song really going viral in Indonesia uh, and hitting those crazy numbers. You know, we've also got another uh, another act of ours, Mazdo. Uh, there's also a massive, massive band and artist in Malaysia. You know, one of their songs, their songs have also gone viral in Indonesia as well. I think there was a song, Dinda, from before that, you know, hit billions of views on TikTok in Indonesia. Uh, and they have a huge fan base in Indonesia. As well. And Indonesia is, is a very tough market to crack because their own talent is 
they're amazing. That's right. right? Exactly. And you making into that means our, our artists making it into the list is, 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 a, is a big achievement. So definitely something we are super proud of. Uh, we hope to, uh, you know, we hope to drive more successes in Indonesia. But, you know, just in the short time I've been at Warner, I've seen massive opportunity. We've seen real case studies of, you know, Malaysian artists really being able to crack the Indonesian market. Uh, so it's something we want to double down on for sure. Um, and back to your original question, like social media is actually a big part of that, uh, of that discovery process, right? So if you went for a TikTok or a Instagram Reels or YouTube Shorts, like, you know, it might be harder to penetrate some of those markets. So I think, you know, social media has really helped to lubricate entry into some of those markets uh, in a big way. Uh, so discovery is important, but on the monetization, we, we do have deals in place at a global level uh, with all of these social media platforms where, you know, we do get paid the more music gets used uh, across these platforms. So we do monetize as well to a certain mm. extent, but I think the the discovery piece is, uh, is, is where there's a huge amount of value uh, in the social media platforms. Yeah, you're right, because nowadays, 70% of the time, if I discover new music, it is on 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 social media. Yeah, means uh, gone are the days when you used to sit and listen to top ten charts or top top twenty hot hits kind of you uh, know shows which used to be on radio. Uh, I think social media is the only place nowadays where they, if if your song is good, it gets you know get a high rotation in terms of reels and and stories, and that's where you go back to Spotify and listen to the whole song. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. I think it's it's a mix of all of these different platforms, actually. Uh, and I don't see it too different to, you know, this is a, an example from my IGE days where, you know, we used to license content from TV, from Media Prima, from TV3 and put it on IGE. Mm. So if you missed it on TV, you would, you would have to watch it on a catch-up basis on IGE. And interestingly enough, uh, like we were benefiting from some of that good content on our platform. So our numbers were looking good. But actually, you know, when I speak to Media Prima, uh, that deal didn't have an impact on their TV ratings, right? Mm. So in some ways, it's kind of a bit of a cross-promotion thing. So I look at it as uh, uh, you got to have a multi-platform uh, marketing strategy where you're kind of hitting all angles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when somebody's on social media, uh, you're seeing that song, right? Being used in different formats. When you are in the car listening to radio, if you're listening to radio, then it's also, you know, you're also hearing it from that angle. Uh, so I see it as all of these platforms are still important today. Yep. Maybe eventually we will move to a world where certain platforms just become way more important than others. But I do feel we are still in that transition phase where you can't ignore all platforms and uh, you just got to have a different strategy for each platform. So I'm going to ask you a very sensitive question. How radio is important in today's uh, music business? Is uh, it still uh, is it still relevant when when such great streaming platforms are there and people don't have to hear too much of talking going on? Uh, so what do you think what, from what from that perspective is is radio important? I think my personal view and just from what I've seen and observed is you know radio is still important. Obviously, it's now. Uh, it used to be the one and only main source of discovery for new songs. I think now it shares that with social media and maybe a few other uh, sources as well. Uh, and social media has become more and more important. But I think, you know, in Malaysia particularly, uh, radio is still, I mean, radio listenership is still high, right? Like I think, I know tons of people who listen to radio on the way to work, on the way back from work, uh, especially uh and, and I think radio itself, uh, you know, from my conversations and observations in terms of how the, the different radio teams are sort of coping with the changes in, in the industries, you know, they've evolved as well. You know, uh, they've taken on different angles. I think radio themselves, like they, they've, they've seen these trends uh, and they, they've evolved. Right. Uh, and, you know, different formats, different types of content. Uh, you know, you know, Astros also launched Shock as well, allowing people to listen to some of that content through their app. Uh, so I think ra one, uh, so to answer your question, like I think radio is still important, but you can't rely on radio alone like you used to, uh, mm -hmm. nor do I think you can completely ignore radio either. I still, I think you got to have a radio strategy. You got to have a social media strategy in order for you to be comprehensive. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, to uh, listenership for radio is still high especially certain segments, of course. 
Uh, and three, I think, you know, radios evolve to include different types of content and format. I think the, the, the challenge or not the challenge, the onus is on us as the, rec- at the record label to work together closely with the radio network to figure out uh, what new innovative ways uh, might there be uh, using the strength of radio today uh, to promote our artists and their songs. So I think, in summary, the platform's still important, but you know we need to constantly be on our toes in thinking how innovative we can be in terms of using the platform. That's a good answer, actually. Uh, because, again, numbers are great on radio. I mean, revenues are great on radio at this point of time. Uh, so that's what I wanted to ask you, is how, radio, how much mm. radio is, is important. Coming to the next question, and I've been a big fan of music videos while growing up. Yep. During the time of MTV and Channel V, as an, I'm, I'm an ex-Channel V. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. yeah. So now, apart from YouTube, are music videos important for an artist to have? And what does a music video in today's time, what does a music music video fulfill for an artist's presence as well as discoverability for for new music? Before I answer the question directly, firstly, I want to say video is as important as ever, maybe more important than it's ever been in today's age of social media as we talked about. Uh, uh, if, if a big source of discovery for new songs is social media, uh, you know, social media is inherently video driven or visual driven used to be visual driven, but increasingly video driven, uh, you know, whether it's Instagram, whether it's TikTok, YouTube. Uh, so video is as important as ever. Uh, so, you know, having a strong video strategy is critical to drive discovery of, a, of new songs. But however, what format that video is in uh, is what we might need to consider uh, depending on the song and the genre. You know, there, ha- there have been studies done I read an article recently, I think done by uh, a re, uh, an analytics company called Chartmetrics that kind of was looking at uh, the impact of music videos. Actually, this very question you're asking me. And I think uh, music videos still has a place for certain genres, right? It really depends on the genre. So some genres are inherently a bit more visual or some markets inherently want songs that also present itself in a more visual form. So I think that article was saying, for example, K-pop, right? Uh, songs are great, but also very highly visual, right? A lot of dance moves, yeah. a lot of slick dance moves and all of that. So highly visual. So music videos do have an impact in certain genres. I think that article is in Latin music, uh, also highly visual. They they, they do appreciate those, their music videos. Uh, there's some other genres where maybe the impact of music videos is not what it used to be. Uh, but, you know, for us, the way we look at it, is, uh, you know, video content still super important, right? Uh, how a music video should manifest itself in today's age, uh, the way we look at it, it, it should be multi-platform, multi-format. So whether we should rethink about the format of music videos hmm. uh, is, is how we look at it. So we have, you know, done music videos, but, you know, is there a music video that could be repurposed for TikTok, for example? Vertical, right? yeah. Vertical, shorter form, uh, instead of, you know, horizontal, uh, uh, three, four minute long music videos, right? So, you know, videos are important. Uh, I think music videos are still important, but the format uh, is something that I think we're constantly reviewing, uh, you know, and which is something we might tweak depending on the artist, depending on the genre, depending on the song, right? So mm-hmm. it has its relevance, but it's just, we just need to be a little bit more mindful in terms of how it manifests itself in the end product. Now, a very serious question. Music piracy. It's been going on for ages. It means from the time we've been growing up, time of Napster and, yep. and, and LimeWire. And, but how is piracy going on? Still pretty rampant uh, during the time of streaming. How are music companies coping with it and how are they putting checks and balances where piracy of music is concerned? Yeah, piracy is always uh, it's always the enemy of the entertainment industry, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it's film, whether it's TV, whether it's music, uh, you know, it's the bane of our it's the bane of our existence. But um, I think from the from the music side, uh, you know, firstly, I think uh, you know these digital platform, these digital streaming platforms have made a big difference 
So, you know, um, you know, for example, with, with platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, and, and these other digital platforms, like being able to access the world's mu- music catalog in a single app uh, for Spotify. And at one point, I can't remember the price now, you know, for 15 ringgit a month yeah. uh, with a seamless user experience is something that, you know, you just, like piracy just can't fight in my opinion, right? So one, I think there is... There is, you know, working closely with tech platforms to develop solutions that are user friendly and provide as much value to users, such that they choose to stream legally instead of illegally. Uh, you know, uh, that is one prong, right? So if users are able to stream all of their favorite songs uh, on a platform with true value from a user experience and a monetary perspective, that's one way to do it. Then there's another pillar, which is, you know, working together as a, as a industry body, working together industry bodies uh, to sort of collectively combat piracy. Uh, you know, we have industry bodies that sort of represent all of the, all of the, all of the local labels, all of the artists in being the voice uh, with government officials, like with RIM. agents like RIM, yeah. exactly. Uh, you know, pushing and championing this as well. So I think in that sense, what I can see from the music industry is that, you know, industry bodies like RIM, um, you know, being around for, for, for decades, uh, are very uh, cohesive uh, in terms and proactive in terms of uh, pushing, pushing things forward that are important for the livelihood of, of our artists, right? So I think they've done a great job uh, over the years in pushing things forward. And, you know, the third piece, of course, is, you know, staying close to the right uh, policy makers as well, uh, which is not too different from the video and film world Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, enforcing, uh, uh, you know, action against pirates, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And, and, you know, funny thing is, I I think, you know, piracy, now now that I've seen both sides, you know, the music side and the TV film side, like, I think there's there's no reason why we all just can't work together, obviously, to to battle piracy. because it's 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 an issue that's plaguing the industry for sure, yeah. uh, and and I think it's a three prong approach. Um, and I think I think the fourth the fourth bit is is my own personal view as well. There's another approach which is uh, a more consumer centric approach, uh, which is a bit of a longer longer burn. But you know, just really continuing to educate uh, the end user and the end consumers mm. uh, on what piracy is and the damage it causes the industry. Uh, I know we always feel like, you know, consume, you know, end of the day, consumers are, are the ones fueling, uh, you know, if there's no, there's no a supply if there isn't any demand, right? Mm-hmm. So con- if, if consumers constantly are seeking to pirate stuff, then, you know, pirates will continue to exist, right? So I feel like, you know, on top of working with the tech platforms, with policymakers, uh, and, and, you know, working as a cohesive unit through industry bodies, like, you know, if art, for example, like, you know, if art, working together artists to educate consumers on how, what they're doing in terms of streaming or what music illegally or watching content illegally is, is impacting the industry and the livelihood of their favorite artists, you know, that's another approach that we could take as well, which is something, you know, we had sort of uh, at Aichi, we were trying to do together with Finas for a bit as well, more on the consumer education side a mm-hmm. couple of years ago. So I feel like all of these things are... Uh, uh, collectively uh, are important to sort of battle piracy. One more question on in regards to <clears throat> new talent. Anybody right now who's a 15-year-old kid sitting inside his bedroom can create music with a few softwares here, publish it on their own. Like there are different ways to publishing, whether it's on YouTube, Spotify, up music. How can a company, a big company like Warner Music can help this kid who's 15 years old, makes great music. How can this come, how can Warner make him a star? You know, you know, it's interesting, right? Like, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, anyone, uh, uh, the process of making music has become faster, easier, mm-hmm. cheaper over the years, right? And then the process of getting your music uh, uploaded onto a platform that where that is accessible by anyone in the world has also been made a lot easier mm. over the years, right? We, which is great, which is great. And, for, which is, and it's all sitting in your pocket and on your cell phone. That's right, that's right. And consuming it's even easier. Yeah. Uh, so that whole process of 
creating, distributing, consuming music has been made easier uh, thanks to, you know, the advancement of technology, uh, you know, over the, over the last decade or so. Uh, so, you know, which is great for artists, right? I think it's great for artists. But, you know, on the, on the flip side, you know, because it's so much easier to create content and because now anyone can create great content and put it up on these platforms, uh, the amount of content and the amount of songs, particularly in our industry, being, you know, being produced, uh, I don't have the stat. I'm sure it's increased, like, yeah. tremendously over the years, right? So, which also means that as a new artist... Uh, trying to make a name for yourself, putting music out there. Yes, it is easier to create that music and it's easier to put your music on that platform. But standing out amongst the sea of, of all those songs being created out there is also a lot harder uh, mm -hmm. than it used to be as well. Um, and, and just because you can create a song doesn't mean you'll be able to make it stand out and, and have it uh, uh, get find its audience base. Mm -hmm. So I think where, where we come in uh, is being a... Imagine you know, us as being able to be that support system across your entire... Oh, one point I want to make, it's it's not only hard to stand out and break through as an artist, it's also as hard to sustain Same. your career as well. Because even if you get like, even if you manage to break out and have, have one hit song, uh, a career is not built on one song, it's built on, you know, a bit more longevity. Yeah, that, uh, that's where the term came, one hit wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so it's even harder to... So if, if, you know, if One Hit Wonders existed, you know, even back in the day, like in today's day and age with all of that infinite sea of content out there, it's going to be even harder to sustain your career. Mm -hmm. So so I think that's where we see our value as a, as a global record label coming in, where we're really a support system uh, in helping you break through as an artist and sustain your career as an artist. And the way we do that is, is you know, one... Uh, uh, you know, we have marketing teams. One, we have a gl global presence. So music is as global as it ever is today. You know, it's every artist's dream to be able to become a global star uh, and even take one step back, become a regional star, right? For as a first step. So, you know, we have we have on-ground on teams in, in most of the major cities across the globe. So that have on-ground know-how in terms of and relationships in terms of the right marketing platforms and channels, uh, and, and, and stakeholders to engage to be able to promote your song effectively uh, whether it's in Malaysia or whether it's in Indonesia or other cities that you might want to penetrate uh, so you know having that marketing function that functional marketing expertise and on-ground presence helps a lot uh, sec secondly is you know being able being plugged into all of you know this where distribution uh, uh, capabilities come in being plugged into all of the major digital platforms you know we have you know, we have teams speaking to Spotify, YouTube, TikTok on a daily, if not weekly basis, right? Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Apple Music, right? We are, we are plugged in to all of these platforms. We have teams that are actively speaking to them on an ongoing basis. Uh, so, you know, as opposed to a new artist trying to build a relationship from scratch and trying to get plugged into all these platforms, you can lean on us to sort of like be that facilitator for you. Uh and, and, you know, the other thing is also because we also have a wealth of, you know, in-house knowledge on successful case studies of what's worked, what hasn't worked, right? So yeah. we, we also can tap onto that knowledge base, uh, you know, not only from the team in Malaysia, but you know, the team across the region or even across the world in terms of sharing best practices uh, and keeping up with, with trends as well uh, that we can take advantage of. And, and the last one is obviously we also can support and on. It's not it's not cheap to market things these days. So, you know, we also can provide funding as well, right? On top of all of those things. So okay. I think, you know, these are all of the things that would provide value to an artist in trying to stand out in today's uh, today's world. So you already made a star. Okay. You got this guy, great guy. He's a one artist. How do you manage and what are your, you know, problems that you face or how to manage these artists on a regular basis? Because you have tons of artists under, under the Warner banner. How do artist management team or the kind of challenges it brings along with it, how do you do that? And, and, and what are these challenges in the first place? I think a lot of it, you know, I think again, like um, every artist has their own vision, has their own goals. And these goals might change as well as you achieve certain goals. You know, you keep dreaming bigger and bigger. You want to do more and more, right? Uh, so I think that's the first point. I think I think that's that's part of the first point. The the second bit 
is you know every artist has their goals but they also have the 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 strengths and things that they need support on right uh just like all of us right everyone every human being has their strengths and weaknesses every human being uh, is good at certain things maybe needs support on other things uh but ultimately where we see us coming in is really one i think the the key thing is one really understanding these uh the 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 goals and vision for our artists and understanding what they need most right so i think what that presents itself is the challenge is just being able to uh i think it's a daily challenge or a weekly challenge of you know be, staying close to the artists uh in terms of really understanding uh where they're going where they need support uh so i feel like if 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 so it just comes down to communication right like being able to seamlessly be on aligned on the same page uh, in terms of supporting the artists and what they need and where they want to go uh i think to me it's just being in constant alignment is 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 the main challenge right uh because everybody you know it it's kind of like when you're working with a, with a bunch of different artists like staying aligned with everyone and being able to provide each of them what they need uh is critical and it's our job uh but you know as the as alignment changes as visions change as challenges evolve like staying on top of it is really critical uh which is, which is what you know we need to constantly remind ourselves as a team to make sure we're always on top of of what the artist needs i think everything else uh in terms of how we do it you know that's that's where we come in as a label right yeah. like hey like some artists for example you know they would achieve a certain amount of success in malaysia and it's kind of like okay like where do we go from here you know we want to get bigger in indonesia for example right we want to grow beyond malaysia so then it's our job to kind of uh uh facilitate that together with for example the one in indonesia team connecting the dots on the ground like mm. you know what kind of regional collaborations we can do maybe with the indonesian artists getting them uh to work with indonesian radio stations for example indonesian influencers or you know what are the right ways to grow it right so i feel like that are challenges like not straightforward because you got to find the right marketing of strategies for each country and each artist mm. and each genre So those are challenges but that's just part of the job. I think the the real key thing really stands stems from uh con- being constantly aligned with all of our artists mm-hmm. and being on the same page in terms of, you know, how we are working together. Are, are we aligned in terms of the vision? Are we aligned in terms of, you know, what the next steps are for the two of us to sort of work together uh to what's achieving that vision? and doing that uh with an entire roster of artists sometimes can be uh you know is is the challenge yep. because you know every artist is different every artist is uh going through a different phase in their mm-hmm. career uh so that's the challenge but that's part of the job which also keeps it keeps it exciting glad to know that uh, you you are taking care of the rock stars <laughs> <laughs> we try our best <laughs> see fans may go break an artist means and we have seen that happen lot many times before how are you making sure that malaysian fans are you know uh, are closer to their artists whether it's locally or internationally how do you make sure that these fans remain loyal to this their idols their music, music idols and uh, because those are the guys who will be going to the concert buying your stuff you know paying money for the streaming services what what are other things which you guys are doing to make sure that these fans remain loyal to to the artist as well as to the brand yeah so fans fans are you know as i mentioned earlier like fans are the livelihood of of any artist right uh you know without without fans uh artists won't you know you know artists won't exist right like fans are super important and and i think you know like getting an artist closer to fans is is something we are super focused on uh so you know our CEO announced recently a couple of months ago that we're actually we brought on board uh uh on a global basis a bunch of tech talent uh that are now building a uh a direct an artist fan uh 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 platform so which would allow artists to sort of connect uh with fans in a more direct way and allow artists to get a lot more data on their fans 
so you know this is a global priority for us in terms of like building that connectivity between artists and fans. There's one piece which is tech driven, so that's the platform, right? Having a pla- having a one own platform that is, that now provides that facilitation between artists and fans uh, is something that we will be rolling out whenever it's ready. I think on this on the set on the the second prong is you know just in terms of how we think about uh, building. Uh, communities uh, of fans for our artists on a day-to-day basis, right? So one of it, having that tech helps, right? But having, I would say, that mentality uh, in terms of constantly brainstorming with the artists in terms of like, what can we do more uh, to engage with our fans, right? So in, uh, you know, content and music today, you know, a lot of it is still consumed uh, in a one-sided manner, but increasingly it's becoming two-sided and more interactive. I mean, mm-hmm. just take social media, for example. Historically, you would just listen to a song and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Now you would do that, but then you would also create a video on TikTok and use your favorite song on that video. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it's moving in a way where, you know, the way music is consumed or used is or enjoyed is becoming more two-sided, right? So I think one tech is one piece, but the second piece is just the mentality of mm-hmm. thinking about fans in a little bit more... Uh, ingrained manner in terms of how we promote a song and build an artist when we think about how we want to promote a new song like um, you know how can we involve the fans more in everything that we do with an artist as opposed to fans being uh, the afterthought right like fans Mm -hmm. being hey we're going to do all these things and then you know eventually the fans are going to enjoy them how can we bring fans along for the ride Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a more participative manner or, or or earlier in that in that journey right as opposed to uh being at the end of the journey completely yeah. well that's that's a great insight actually and i think fans will love it because when they will be taken to the whole journey i think they will also feel you know obligated to be with the brand and with the band so that uh, this this kind of journeys should happen on a regular basis having said that when leaving music aside means uh, uh, audiobooks which is pretty big all around the world and still not taken on steam in malaysia why is it uh, you know a, such an underserved market in malaysia and are there any plans by warner to fill that space which is empty at this point of time i think at this point in time uh no, I mean definitely for one music. I can speak for one music Malaysia. We're still very much focused on on music mm-hmm. as opposed to you know general audio entertainment. So I think it's still very like it's still music entertainment based, and that's still our core focus. We think there's a lot more that can be done on the music side, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of our vision for our artists and and the potential they can achieve. So I think that's going to be a core focus of ours. Uh, so short answer for the so the second answer is is no. I think we're sticking to to music because you know there's big opportunity there. Uh, uh, more broadly on on audiobooks, uh, this is all my own personal my own personal opinion. I think it's I think it is starting to pick up steam a little bit. I mean, I think podcasts are helping, right? I mean, obviously, this I'm pod- ready to sign yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up for signing. <laughs> Grace is a bit up for up for grabs. Uh, but I, I think podcasts are helping, right? Like, uh, and 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 you know, obviously, like podcasts like yours. And then, like, obviously, like, you know, not to name specific podcasts, but, you know, like, Kaluas Kajap, for mm. example, by like KJ and Sharil. Yeah. Like, obviously, like, that's created a whole buzz around podcasts. You know, recently, there was a podcast festival yeah. as well. Uh, I think a couple of months ago in KL. You know, a podcast festival. I don't. I, I wonder if that's that might have been the first podcast festival in Malaysia or, or the first one that has been marketed at that scale mm. as well. You know, these are things that haven't happened before, right? So, I think which are good indications of where the market's going. Uh, do feel like audio, uh, uh, entertainment in audio formats is starting to pick up steam. Uh, I agree with you that maybe it hasn't historically been as high as perhaps other countries. Uh, although I do think that's starting to change, right? Because sometimes it, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, uh, some of these things require a little bit of education. Uh, and, and it's a, t- a question of timing as well. But, you know, with, with, with adoption of, of these new trends, like it happens exponentially, right? Mm. 
so it's not it's not a, it's never a linear line right yeah. uh, so it might seem slow now but you know as it picks up steam we'll start to see it grow exponentially so I wouldn't be surprised if you know again if we have this conversation one year's time we might see like much bigger numbers than we see today I hope so because I, I'm a big fan of, of audiobooks and I want local content to be to be heard on on streaming platform and bigger companies like Warner Music should look into it so that's one of the reasons why I asked you that question so what do you think uh, you know the future of Malaysian music artists will be in the next five years I mean I would one I would love Malaysia to be a regional music hub uh, for Southeast Asia I think Malaysia has a tremendous potential we have a lot of great talent great creative talent I feel like uh, you know policymakers are increasingly aligned as well uh, we've got the right ecosystem over here so you know there's no reason why Malaysia specifically can't be a music hub for the region. Uh, and when I say hub, I mean, you know, a hub for international acts who want to perform in Malaysia, which would then have a knock-on effect on growing the ecosystem, as mm. I mentioned earlier. But two, you know, really a hub for the export of uh, Ma Malaysian music, you know, made in Malaysia music outside of Malaysia. You know, I mentioned earlier, we're already starting to see... Uh, some good traction in Indonesia with some Malaysian artists. Actually, you know, M M Malaysia's biggest exports to Indonesia have historically always been in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, Upin and Ipin, you know, Siti Noaliza, both very big in Indonesia. And some might joke they are our biggest exports to Indonesia. Um, and, you know, in recent days, we've also seen great successes as well uh, in Indonesia. So I feel like we'll start to see more and more, you know, the, the vision is to start to see more and more Malaysian music uh, succeed and get traction, way more traction than it has today regionally. Obviously, Indonesia is a natural spot because of the language, but but we're also seeing Malaysian artists start to get traction across the region as well. Uh, we've also seen global successes uh, from Malaysian entertainers as well. Uh, Yuna, you know, on the music side, you know, Michelle Yeoh, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, as well. So again, like, there's no reason why Malaysian talent uh, across the entertainment ecosystem uh, and within music, of course, uh, start to, uh, you know, accelerate, uh, you know, traction globally, right? We've seen it happen before. It's not something that hasn't happened before. We've seen success stories. You know, there's, there's already a bunch of case studies of it happening. Um, so I feel like uh, this is the time when we start to really see uh, us all hopefully working together. Uh, and, you know, we'll do our part. Uh, as Warner Music Malaysia to support that, but really the whole industry in Malaysia sort of working together to create to make us a hub, right? Uh, so that people want to perform in Malaysia and have a great time doing it. And Malaysian artists have a platform, right? Uh, where we are able to sort of create this bridge across different countries across the globe mm. to, to, to really let and help allow Malaysian artists make their mark uh, outside of Malaysia. That's, that's good to hear. Any, uh, you know, any of the big acts happening this year which you want to talk about and, you know, if any big artist is coming this year, we, we should be looking forward to to going to the concert too. <laughs> you, you know, I, I would love to share more. We do have a couple in the works, but I'm not at the liberty to publicly announce them yet. Okay. But, you know, stay tuned, uh, you know, follow our social media and you'll be, the, <laughs> you'll, you'll definitely be up to date. So on, there, on the are, there, there are plans. There are a few in the works. Yeah. Okay, great. Great to hear that. With that, we come to the end of the interview, uh, Dinesh. It's been an uh, amazing uh, time which we had talking to you and learning so much about the music industry in Malaysia and the plans for the future. We wish all the best for one of the music to 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 bring in all the great artists and to expand the music industry in Malaysia as as per what you're planning to do. Thanks so much, Abid, for having me. I really enjoyed uh, this session. Thank you. That was Dinesh Ratnam giving insights into the music business in Malaysia. Stew on this till we meet again in the next episode of What's Stewing. Mm -hmm.